Catastrophic plate tectonics is well known to creationists. It was unveiled at the Third International Conference on Creationism in Pittsburgh in 1994 by six creationist PhDs, Steve Austin, John Baumgardner, Russell Humphreys, Andrew Snelling, Larry Vardaman, and Kurt Wise. Dr. Baumgardner had run a supercomputer simulation of a slab of oceanic crust diving rapidly into the earth. The group said this powered high-speed plate tectonics during the flood year. So instead of taking 180 million years to open the Atlantic Ocean, as in standard plate tectonics, it took less than a year. This is how he explains it. The top panel is temperature, where red is hot and blue is cold. The arrows denote velocities. And uh, the bottom panel is the rock strength, where, where blue is weak and red is strong. And uh, this dark blue color represents a, uh, a strength a billion times smaller than what the rock would, would have if it was not under stress. So, what is this? so we're partway in, the, in a runaway regime here where these red uh, blobs, these red plumes, have suddenly uh, started rising at a high rate of speed, uh, rising toward the surface. So this is after five days into this calculation, after this runaway begins. So they come roaring up to the surface and cause the top surface, the blue region, which is cold, uh, uh, then to run away. So th this is after 12 and a half days. The, the uh, hot plumes are near the top. That, that top, uh, the cold material has, has started to run away, plunging to the bottom. Uh, the, most of the region, as you see in the bottom panel, is blue, has become very weak. And so this whole, this whole volume is, has become weak and moving very rapidly. The, the height of the box is, is two, uh, about 2,000 miles. So it corresponds, I've chosen the, the, uh, the parameters in this calculation to uh, represent the Earth's mantle. And the velocity denoted by U max there in this panel is like five and a half meters per second. That's many miles per hour. I think that's about 10, or 10 to 15 miles per hour this material is sinking. And this is at 20 days. Materials uh, uh, slowing down. Velocity is only at 2.3 meters per second here. And it rapidly uh, decreases in the bottom panel in subsequent uh, times becomes red. And uh, so it, it, uh, the, uh, the thing comes to a relatively rapid halt after the gravitational potential energy driving this, this uh, process uh, is, is exhausted. I take that uh, rough, roughly that present day continents, move them back to their Pangean positions, put coal material around most of the boundary of this supercontinent, the blue that you see there. That, that blue material is uh, 400 degrees cooler than everything else, extends down about 400 kilometers into the mantle. This is a slice through the equator. The white area in the middle corresponds to the core. I'm not uh, including the core in the calculation. And I use this initial condition, this initial distribution of coal material to start the motion, to start the calculation going, and I simply solve the conservation equations uh, uh, in the computer, allowing this system to, to develop as it, as it wants to. And so this is the result at the surface uh, after 15 days time, and we see the blocks, these continental blocks, pulling apart uh, primarily driven by this coal sinking material. And I have plate boundaries in the ocean areas where uh, there's evidence that they, they also existed. And we have the, these ocean plates pulling apart along those, those boundaries. So that's the surface, that's a view at 65 kilometers depth. This is a, the slice through the equator. We see the coal material sinking. Uh, and it, it thickens, it, those blobs get thicker because I've put in a, a higher uh, strength in the lower part of this mantle, as various lines of ind uh, evidence indicate. And uh, so this is, this is 
at 25 days, and there's been a lot of motion. We have velocities at the surface on the order of three and a half meters per second. The blocks are moving roughly in the right directions. Uh, this is a, a cross-sectional view, the coal material sinking down toward the bottom, eventually spreading over the bottom, and uh, the process coming to a halt. The group wrote that the flood was initiated as slabs of oceanic floor broke loose and subducted along thousands of kilometers of pre-flood continental margins, the blue lines here. Yet even in conventional plate tectonics, the question on how to break lithospheric plates and initiate subduction remains a matter of debate. Generally, it is thought that oceanic lithosphere densifies as it cools, therefore becoming increasingly negatively buoyant as it ages. At some point, this negative buoyancy should be large enough to prompt the oceanic lithosphere to sink into the mantle, therefore initiating subduction. However, it has been shown that buoyancy forces are too small to bend the lithosphere and overcome the frictional stresses in the fault, and that therefore external forces are required to initiate subduction. Even if there was a break in the crust, pushing it down into the mantle rock is only the first problem. Bending the lithosphere takes almost 40% of the required subducting force. However, none of that matters because Dr. Baumgartner wrote that it begins with ocean floor already subducted, about 660 kilometers, 410 miles, which he thinks would take about 20 million years. As to initial conditions, there is a mound of cold, negatively buoyant rock atop the boundary between the upper and lower mantle at a depth of 660 kilometers. One difficulty in making a connection between these calculations and the flood is their time scale. Some 20 million years is needed before the instability occurs in the second calculation. Most of this time is involved with the accumulation of a large blob of cold, dense material at the barrier created by the phase transition at 660 kilometers depth. Perhaps God made the earth with long subduction zones and pre-sunk oceanic crust. So then he guesses it would take the blow from a modest sized meteorite impact to shake the blob and initiate nucleation of seed crystals, converting the metastable material to the denser phase needed to sink quickly, even though substantial amounts of the less dense phase can survive to depths much greater than what the assumption of a spontaneous transition would imply. And there are places like that today below Japan, Chile, and Fiji that have no shortage of earthquakes around them, but no runaway subduction either. If runaway subduction did start, it was supposed to pull the plates with it. Unfortunately, the type of subduction in catastrophic plate tectonics is similar to drip-off mode, in which the slab stretches internally until it ultimately detaches. In this mode, the slab is not capable of pulling down ocean crust into the mantle. Also, subduction zones on Earth always dip at an angle, with one side overriding the subducting side. Like the Nazca slab, subducting beneath South America, none drop straight down from the trench the way Baumgartner's computer simulation requires. This map shows Earth's actual subduction zones and their depths. This 2,000 thick layer of rock below the, the plates is known as the mantle. It's uh, almost everywhere solid, not liquid, like a lot of people have been led to think. It's solid rock. The group says runaway subduction along the blue lines made the entire upper mantle in the rest of the world very fluid. There is no reason why that should be true. Power law creep in silicate rocks is well known. Stress fluidizes mantle rock and the only stress here is at the head of the blob. The rest of the upper mantle would remain solid. Convection cells in regular plate tectonics come from heat exchange with the surface, and they flow extremely slowly. But here they need the viscosity of the mantle to be lowered from solid rock to a fluid to allow runaway subduction to occur in the time frame of the flood. The Earth's mantle appears to have been less viscous than it seems to be at present. This is to allow for the thermal runaway instability which we believe 
produce the rapid plate tectonic motion we are proposing. A tenfold reduction in the reference viscosity gives ten times higher velocities. But then that causes a problem. The churning convecting mantle is supposed to move the crust. Yet the more fluid the mantle, the less friction, the less traction it would have on crust above it. The more fluid the upper mantle, the less pull it has on the crust. The authors have always acknowledged a critical problem with the theory. It generates excessive heat through rapid turnover of the mantle. Continental crust is very hard to rip apart. It is considerably thicker than oceanic crust. To pull it apart requires much more than just distant stretching, even if the mantle had traction. Researchers used to think that plumes of hot magma weakened continental crust from below. But a study showed that no region fits a plume-driven breakup model that predicts pre-breakup magmatism. And why would the single continent pull apart into the shapes we see today? The protocontinent was not a conglomeration of pieces. It was a single mass of continental crust. If they were able, the two subduction zones in catastrophic plate tectonics would just split the lower part of Pangaea in half. In conventional plate tectonics, a continent on a subducting plate stops moving when it reaches the trench, such as when India reached Asia. However, you can see here that in the computer simulation of catastrophic plate tectonics, North and South America crossed the trench, the blue line, and continued to move west onto the Pacific plate, which is moving east. That wouldn't be possible. Collisions of continents at subduction zones are the likely mechanism for the creation of mountain fold and thrust belts. That is true for the Himalayas, but not for the Andes and Rocky Mountains which have no colliding continent opposing them. How are these mountain ranges built? So to make catastrophic plate tectonics happen, the authors start with thousands of miles of oceanic crust, cut, bent, and sunk 410 miles into the earth, something Dr. Baumgartner thinks might take 20 million years, though there is no reason it would happen at all then something would trigger all the sunken crust to begin the first phase transition to start runaway subduction, maybe shaking from a giant meteorite impact. The blobs would sink in drip-off mode, which doesn't pull the crust behind it. But even if it could pull crust down, the upper mantle needs to be fluid instead of solid rock the way it is now, in order to start global convection cells, perhaps ten times less viscous. Yet overturning the whole upper mantle would produce extreme heat at the surface, and fluid mantle flow would have much less traction on continental crust, which is supposed to be pulled apart. But continental crust is very hard to pull apart. If it did split, it would likely divide in half between the two subduction zones. There is no reason it would divide into the pieces we see today. In Dr. Baumgartner's simulation, the subduction zone on the American west coast would start to pull it west, opening the Atlantic Ocean. But once it crosses that subduction zone, it encounters the Pacific plate being pulled east by the same subduction zone. So North and South America would stop moving, yet they continue to move west in the simulation. <sighs> Folks, it should now be clear that catastrophic plate tectonics has no connection to reality. The fact that many Christians have been led to believe this fantasy is catastrophic. No doubt, it is because of the reputations of the authors and the public knowing little about geophysics. If you want to see a creationist geology theory based on the observable, unique shapes and positions of features on the surface of the Earth, take a look at the shock dynamics geology theory at newgeology.us.